We, we, we all learned a lot, at least some of us learned a lot from last year's uh, Clive's yeah. presentation, and I hope we'll earn it equally as much tonight. So, and thanks very much for coming down. Thanks. All right, so um, today is about some tactics. So, do you want to uh, take one, pass it on? Uh, so, before, before, we start, um, before we start talking about tactics, the first thing I want to talk about is, is actually the most common mistake. I've seen at this club over the last kind of couple of weekends we've been doing the spring series, and that is actually it's um, it's more to do with last year's topic, which is about sailing fast, and um, and so so what I've noticed is that uh, when we're when we're sailing along and a puff hits, people react very well to it. They use the main, they keep the boat flat, um, and they they point up a little, um, but. What then happens is, when we get a lull, people people don't, or there's a general tendency not to recover the main sheet, let the kicker off, power the main sail back up again, and uh, and reset the boat for the, for the less wind. And so what I've noticed is that when I come off the start line, if there's a puff, people keep up with me, and then as soon as the boat the wind drops, I reset all the sails, and the boats around me don't. Stop nudging away in front of everybody, and uh, and that that is um, that is going to cost you more than any of these tactics. So um, so uh, it's it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those. So it's it's kind of one of the kind of fundamental things to, to fix. And if you if you look at the kind of three sailors in this club who are less guilty of than than other people, I would say that they are myself, Damien. Just back for the lulls better than anybody else. Okay, so that's my that's my first first point. I just thought I'd mention that because um, because, uh, because it's something I've, I've just seen, seen a lot of. Um, so uh, so this is this is all about tactics and tactics generally in a in a national fleet will gain you about good tactics as opposed to bad tactics will gain, gain you about ten places. So it's not the kind of thing that's going to take you right to front of the fleet at time. Um, boats that you can say fast will take you to the front of the fleet zone, but tactics will get you from you know, 20th place to 10th or 10th place to 1st, um, uh, which obviously is, is everyone's aim. Um, so if you, if you look through these notes, um, they're, they're not kind of, they're, they're, they're actually just notes and, and with a few diagrams. I'm picking out a few important themes about tactics, and what I hope to do is uh, get you all to kind of think differently about tactics and try and get people um, where you're saying a two-handed boat working together as a helm and crew uh, in a in a kind of more structured way. Okay? So um, hope, hopefully this will kind of open your mind to, to what's going on. Um, but it's 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 quite an exhaustive list of tactics. Uh, if you want that then books like this are really good. So, wind strategy by Dave Cannon. We really, really recommend that. And uh, this one, Tide Form Sailing by uh, Frank Beckley. Okay. Okay, so today what we're going to talk about is the first thing we're going to talk about is the purpose of tactics. And then we're going to go on to um, talk about different boats and the fact that different boats need different tactics. And then we're going to play a little game, a little tactics game, and I'll need a few volunteers for that. And, and that, will, that will hopefully illustrate um, one, of the, one of the main things. Um, then we're going to look at some examples of how you can predict the wind. Um, and then there's a there's a piece on um, tactics over over the fleet. So uh, some people call this kind of fleet sense, and I think this is this is one of the areas that's toughest to get. And you get a lot of good club sailors who are very fast in a straight line. And, um, but, but, but there's something missing when they go to the, the big fleet events. And what I'm trying to give you there is some insight into how to cope with big fleet tactics. Okay? Uh, then there's a piece on risk and reward. And, um, and lastly, there's an exercise on which you guys can get into groups and do on um, preparation, pre-start preparation. So throughout this, 
So at the end, I'm going to ask, I'm going to say to you, get into groups and write down a list or think of a list of things that you would do before the start in order to inform your tactics for the race. And so think about that while I'm, while I'm um, presenting um, because that's what you're going to be doing at the end. Okay? So back to the beginning, we'll start with the purpose of tactics. The purpose of tactics, um, I, I, I sort of sat down and had to think about this, and, and the three things you're really trying to do are, firstly, you're trying to either sail at a faster speed, plus, of course, that the navigators just sail at a faster speed, or you're trying to sail a shorter course, so a shorter distance, or you're trying to make your opponents either sail further or slower. Okay, so that all sounds simple, but if you, if you break it down to those three things, then, then you'll have a good idea of what your objective is when you're, when you're trying to do the tactics. Now, here I'm only actually going to talk about the first two. So the third one, which is making your opponent sail further or slower, which sounds really kind of mean, and that actually is quite mean, um, really, kind of, really dominates in match racing and team racing, but it doesn't play much of a part in feet racing, so, and it's quite complicated. So, I'm actually going to um, I'm going to I'm going to park that one and talk about the, the two most important ones. Okay. So let's just start by thinking about what information would be useful to you when you're thinking about tactics. Okay. And I've written a, a short list here. So one of the things that might be in, uh, of of interest to you would is the future wind direction. So where the wind direction will be later on. Okay. Also, the wind direction and wind speed across the course. So if you know that there's more wind on one side of the course, that's going to be useful too. Okay. Um, or if you know that the wind direction is going to be different on one side of the course, that's going to be useful too. And there are a lot of observations you can make that will, that, that will lead you to that kind of conclusion. We'll, we'll come to those a bit later. Um, also, the tide. Um, and the performance of your boat is actually important too. And uh, lastly, the position of your competitors. So, um, so let's have, let's have a think about tactics. Is all about making observations and then generating some kind of insight from those observations, and then form, then making a decision as to which which way to sail. Course or uh, uh, yeah, so we, effectively, which which route to take to to, to, to either guard the beat or to go down the run. Um, so some of the observations you can make, types of observations, are things like the, the weather forecast. You can look at the wind on the water. Uh, you can look at other boats. So one of the things you might do is look at a cruising boat that's you know halfway up the course and decide whether it's either lifted or headed on one tack. Uh, you can look at clouds. Uh, you can look at the direction of boats at anchor. So which way they're swinging will give you an idea of the tide. Um, you can look at um, the competition and where they are on the course. And the direction of flags, so the direction of the flags of the committee boat can give you an idea of what, what, which direction the wind's travelling and the kind of committee boat. Um, and also, uh, at the bottom of this page, so in, in the kind of introductory piece, I've put a, a table that gives you the idea of the role of the crew in, in tactics, um, that takes in tactics. And, and what I've put here is kind of three different standards of, of crew. I've put kind of a club standard of crew at the bottom, a national standard crew, and then an international standard crew. And they're kind of standards that I've, uh, I've kind of made up. Um, now, at club level, a lot of the time, all the crew is doing on the beat is balancing the boat and tripping the jib. Okay? And as you get to more advanced, the, 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 the crew takes over a, uh, a, a larger role in tactics. And so what you find with a lot of crews that you'll, you'll find um, doing open meetings in the GP fleet and other fleets is that they will feed the helmsman tactical information. So they will give him idea, you know, there's a patch of more wind on the water over there. Uh, there's one of my, one of the, um, one of our competitors is on the lifter over there, that, that kind of information. And then when you get up to really good crews, so international standard crews, um, 
they'll actually start to make recommendations and they'll do a really important thing, which is they'll take the information and they'll tell you what it means. So uh, instead of saying, there's a patch of more wind over there, they'll say, uh, it looks like we should tack because there's a patch of more wind over there, or it looks like we should stand on because there's a patch of more wind in that direction. Uh, uh, and um, when I'm saying my brother, he'll say stuff like that, and he'll say, just take a look to check, and you take a look to check, and, and then you either tack or hold or, or make a decision. And that makes a really big difference. And the reason it makes a really big difference is because if you look at all the things the helmsman has got to do, down to the club standard crew, the helmsman has to sail to the telltales, constantly address the control lines and changing conditions, which comes back to my pre previous point about sailing through lulls. Direct the changes to the jib sheet and readjustments, so things like the chocks and, and exactly where you want the jib sheet. Make wind and tide observations, generate insights from wind and tide information, and make tactical decisions, which is a lot of stuff to do. And if you're doing all of that, you can't really concentrate hard. So, you know, something's going to miss. So you can't really concentrate hard on the two most important things for the helmsman to be doing, which are sails and telltales and constantly adjust the control lines and the changing conditions. And they're always the most, two most important things you do. Okay? So the more the crew, tactics is really heavily a crew, a cruise thing in a, in a two-man boat. So the more that you can more load you can take off the helmsman, um, the, hel the more weight you can take off the helmsman's brain, especially when the helmsman's brain is a little bit challenged like mine, um, the, the, the better, the faster you can actually sail boat through the water. So it's kind of a double whammy of having a, having a crew that's good at tactics. Um, and that's why, um, that's, that's part of the reason why my, my brother is such a good crew, is because he takes that he takes that load. As soon as, as, soon as I get the boat with him, he takes that load off. He's, the, the whole of the tactical situation is in his head. It's like, I don't need to have it in my head, and I can just make the boat go fast. And it makes a, makes a huge difference. Okay, so that's, that's the first part. So um, let's look at an example. And let's look at a, a trade. So if we have. Um, if everyone can see this, uh, this diagram here? Yeah? Can this one? Now what we have here is we have a dilemma. We have a situation where on the one side of the course I've got winds blowing 10 knots. On the other side of the course we have a headland and at the bottom end of the course the wind's blowing 10 knots and at the top end of the course the wind's blowing 8 knots but the wind is shifted. So can everybody see what's going to happen? If somebody goes up the right hand side of the beat they're going to get more wind, but they're going to have to sail further. And if someone goes to the left-hand side of the beat, beat, they're going to get less wind, but they're going to get a lifter coming to the mark, so they're going to have to sail north as far. So, has anyone got any ideas about which side's going to pay? That's a good idea. That's a good idea. So you can. Um, I've done that before. Uh, um, at Access, where you have a you have a buddy that you sail with, and you go full start. You go each goes one side of the beat and comes in at the top mark, and uh, and you and two others in front. So, so test it. Really good idea. Um, so I think. Let, why don't we turn over and look at the next chart and see if that's going to help us decide. Okay. So the next chart shows us. It's just a schematic. All I've done is kind of sketched three graphs. It shows us the performance upwind of three different boats. Okay? One of them is GP14, one of them is a fireball, and one of them is a hurricane. Okay? So you've got a catamaran, you've got a trapeze boat, and you've got a hiking boat. Okay? Now, the, if you notice, um, so there's a couple things to notice about this. Firstly, the GP 
because it's a hiking boat, it, um, it, once it gets up to speed, it doesn't go any faster upwind. So it will quite quickly get up to speed, in about 12 knots of wind, you'll be going as fast as you're ever going to go upwind in a GP, and then it won't be any faster. And it does that because it gets up to hull speed. Okay? Now if you look at the fireball, the fireball is very different. The fireball up to about 9 knots or so, just under 10 knots, it's, it's going faster and faster, and then it jumps. So at 9 knots, suddenly it's going quite a bit faster. Okay? And what's happening to the fireball there, is it starts to plane upwind. So there's a certain speed, speed with plane boats, you're either not planing or you're planing. So there's a certain speed you just can't, you can't get to. You can't have that speed. You're either going slow or you're going fast. Okay? So the fireball has this kind of jump in speed upwind. And the more wind you get in the fireball, the faster you go. There's no plateau. It doesn't stop going faster and faster. Okay? The hurricane's different again. Hurricane doesn't plane up wind, but it doesn't have the limited speed that the GP can have. So a hurricane will keep going faster and faster, but um, it doesn't have that jump in speed up wind. Okay? Because it doesn't plane up wind. So what we what we can see here is if we if you turn back to the diagram and if we think about so if we think about a GP going to the left and a GP going to the right, what's going to happen? The left go faster, but get fired quicker. Why? Because it's getting a better lift of the thing, you know, slow by knots, or going at eight knots, it's getting a less distance to travel. So it's, so it's going to keep its same full speed. speed. Yeah, so the, so the difference between a GP in eight knots of wind and a GP in ten knots of wind in terms of speed is very little. But the distance, the difference in distance travelled is quite big. So as you can see from, I think I've said the distance, the difference in distance is approximately 15%, and the difference in speed might be 5%, but it won't be enough to make it up. So, same logic, what would happen if there were two fireballs going up the To the one to the right be quicker. Yeah, because, they're, because, it's, because it's going much faster up the beat. And what about two hurricanes? Same against the left. Well, uh, so the hurricanes I think would be close. They'd be close to, to each other because the hurricane. Remember, it's still. If you look at the graph, it's still uh, on a. Um, it's still. Uh, it's got quite a gradient at the ten, at ten knots. So it's still going quite a bit faster. So the hurricanes I think would be close. So if you imagine a handicap race with two hurricanes, two fireballs, and two GPs. One GP goes one way. One GP goes the other, one fireball goes one way, one fireball goes the other, one hurricane goes one way, one hurricane goes the other. Two hurricanes would get to the mark pretty much at the same time. The fireball that went to the right would get there ahead of the fireball that went to the left, and the GP that went to the left would get there ahead of the GP that went to the right. So the tactics depend on the boat you're sailing and the conditions you're in and what dominates your tactical decisions. Okay, so we've seen two. We've seen we've seen a trade-off between two things there. One is wind direction, and the other one is wind speed. Um, there's a third tide. Uh, so some, some um, sometimes there might be more wind one side of the course and more tide um, on the other side of the course, so something like that. So you, you're having to make trade-offs in your head. Uh, and the the way the way I think about it is that um, I make a decision before the start as to whether um, the day is dominated for me in the boat I'm sailing in by wind direction, wind speed, or tide. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Slightly black faces. You know, the 420 would be akin to the fireball with the yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's right, yeah. But the 420, it takes a little bit more wind before That's only fine at that particular stage, because yep. eventually, 30 minutes later, the whole thing could slightly yep. change. Because the tide is different, the wind, is, the winds in the course yep. is different. So, yeah. so you don't absolutely. Know. All I'm trying to illustrate with this <laughs> is that you've got a trade off between different things. So you've got to think before you before.
before you start the race, you've got to think, am I looking for lifters or am I looking for more wind? Or am I looking for tide, a tide advantage? What is going to dominate my tactics today? Yeah? And then the GP, in, unless it's light winds and you're, you're on the beginning of that curve where you're getting a lot more speed for a little bit more breeze, it's generally um, lifters that will dominate. And the same for a laser. And uh, in a fireball, it's generally wind that will dominate. So you're generally looking for more wind and you don't you don't care so much about lifters and headers. And uh, likewise in a in a catamaran, generally speaking, you're looking for more wind. Yeah? Does that does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Are people learning something here? Yeah? Okay, so have a look at the next chart. Okay. So the, the next one is one I, I got from the internet. And this is a um, this is a chart, this is, uh, this is the way that yacht designers think about speed of boats, or this is part of, um, uh, you know, sort of standard yacht design packages can produce this for, for a given yacht design. And um, what it shows you, each line has a little number next to it, and the number is the wind speed in, in knots, and then it shows you how fast the boat will travel at, an, at, at a given angle to the wind. So if you look at the six knot, knot of wind line, which is that inside line there, the, at 60 degrees to the wind, the boat is travelling about six and a bit knots. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Can people, can people read that from the graph? Yeah. yeah. And if you look at the 20, if you look at the 20, um, the 20 knot line, which is the black line on the outside, and look at 150 degrees to the wind, then the boat will be travelling just over 12 knots. Okay, so now I'm going to ask you a question. What type of spinnaker do you think this yacht has? By looking at the graph. Sorry? Yeah, how do you know? Because it's sending a lot deeper. So it goes slower down then. Yeah, that's right. So if you look at, if you drew, so the, the jive angle, so to work out the optimum jive angle for this boat downwind, if you take a ruler and move it slowly up the page until the first bit of line disappears, so it's, say it's blowing 20 knots, the first bit of line disappears, and, uh, and you find the lowest point of that 20 knot line, that gives you the furthest you can get downwind, or the fastest you can get downwind fastest your velocity downwind will be. Yeah? So you, you'd be looking at sailing quite quite well across the wind, uh, downwind, which must mean it has an aspect. People to be one standard? Did you get that? Or they lost? Uh, let me see if I can do it on the so uh, I'll draw it. We're gonna draw one of these right here. What you've got is you've got a curve that goes uh, like that, okay? And this width, that's your, um, and that's your center point there. So you've got a curve that goes like that. Now your, um, the optimum jive angle downwind, if you draw a tangent to that line there, so that's a right angle, that is your optimum jive angle downwind. So that's the direction you'll point downwind because it gives you your maximum speed in a directly downwind direction. Okay? Which must mean that this has a mass vector spinner because it's pointing up quite a long way to get downwind. You'd expect with a symmetrical spinnaker, you'd expect the curve to look more like that and for your, your optimal drive angle. Does that make sense? People get that? Okay. All right. So that's a slight aside. Um, what you can do in your um, is um, or what, what's, it's this. I find this a really useful way to think about um, to think about your your boat and its performance. <coughs> uh, 
Another way to think about it is if you're sitting in the middle of the lake in your boat and you sailed, and you think about, well, if I sailed in, in the conditions of a minute, if I sailed in every direction for a minute, how far would I go? And then draw, draw a line on the water to show how far you'd go in that one minute. 